Good morning. Uh, thanks, Claire, for leading us in that time of prayer. Um, this morning we are uh, starting a brand new Easter series, uh, which is titled Jesus Is. Um, we're going to be thinking this morning about what our, or throughout this series, we're going to be thinking about five uh, key uh, life changing statements about who Jesus is. Um, the reality for you and for me is uh, Jesus is Easter. Easter is Jesus. Uh, for us to understand what Easter is all about, then we have to understand who Jesus is and what he did, why he came. Um, we understand who Jesus is when we understand what the Bible says. Um, I hope that's uh, obvious for all of us uh, today. And there's so much we could look at when it comes to understanding what the Bible says about Jesus. But how powerful it is for you and for me over the course of the next few weeks, uh, our plan is to hear words from those who were face to face with Jesus. So those who encountered Christ and who had something to say about their experience uh, with him. Um, those who saw him, those who heard him, those who spoke with him, those who were friends with him, and ultimately those who responded in faith. Um, my prayer this morning is that we would have that fresh encounter uh, with the living Jesus. Uh, and we would in some way echo these statements we're going to look at over the next five weeks. Does that make sense? Is that, is that clear in terms of where we're going? Um, so next week we're going to think about that declaration from Peter in Mark 8. Uh, you are the Messiah. Um, the week after that, uh, TJ will be uh, preaching on Palm Sunday, focusing on, what we, on that phrase the crowds declared, Hosanna to the Son of David. Then Good Friday, we're going to take time to look together at the spiritual awakening that took place in the life of the centurion, uh, when he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Uh, then on Easter Sunday, we're going to take time to dig into the words of the angels as they stood by the empty tomb. He is not here, but he has risen. And so this morning, we start at the beginning of the gospel, of John. We're going to take time to look at the words of John the Baptist. So Jesus came towards John the Baptist. John the Baptist saw him from a distance and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, such important words for us to come to terms with this morning uh, as we think about all that God would want to do uh, in our lives uh, through this time in the Word. And the reality for you and I is that we understand these words from John the Baptist as we find them in the context of the wider passage of what John says, but also we understand the context of that passage as we understand what the entire Bible says about Jesus, okay? So if you have your Bibles, let's have a look at uh, John 1 and verses 29 to 34. Uh, the words are gonna be up on the screen. I'm reading from the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, so John says this starting in, in verse 29. So John 1 and verse 29. John says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I told you about. After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he existed before me. I didn't know him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he rested on him. I didn't know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water told me, the one you see the Spirit descending and resting on, he is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Amen. Let's just take a moment to pray. So, Father, this, this is your word, and we are your people, and we pray that, that you, you speak to us today. Lord, we, we recognize that in our own flesh, with our own devices, it is impossible for us to understand fully and completely what you have to say to us. Lord, would you convict of sin? Lord, would you renew hearts? Would you um, awaken our minds so that we understand what your word says, but we would also hear very, very clearly through the work of your Holy Spirit exactly something of who you are, but also something of who it is you've called us to be. So Lord, take this time and use this time for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I don't know how you think or feel uh, about Easter. Uh, for myself, it's always a, a really uh, precious time. Uh, I just love uh, this season. Uh, one of the things I love about Easter is the fact that our focus on Jesus' death and his resurrection also coincides with the new life that we see. And just day to day, we walk around it and we see new life. Um, and it's quite something for us to recognise that embedded within the cycle of nature 
And the routine of seasons, year after year, is the story of the gospel. From life to death to life again. We see that every year. And that's something of a story of what God has done for us in Christ. He has given his life. We are dead in our sins. And yet he has brought us back to life in Christ. And right now we're in March. Next week the clocks are going forward. I think so. Is that right? Clocks are going forward next week. Um, so things are going quickly. Um, and we're about to impart, embark upon a season of spring. Which will remind us of the fact that death and decay never has a last word over our lives. And that's something that we all need to hear this morning. Death and decay will never have the last word over our lives. In whatever scenario or situation that we face, there is always, always hope because of Jesus. And that kind of thinking and mentality was taking place in the life and the ministry of John the Baptist in our passage. John the Baptist wanted people to understand that the death the despair, the, sh the sense of sheer and utter hopelessness that so many people had in his day because the anticipated Messiah had not arrived yet was now coming to an end and it was coming through the person of Jesus. He offered this hope and it was more than coming to an end, it had finished. The people could now experience fulfilled hope because of Jesus. He was in their midst in the days of John the Baptist. And we see this so clearly in our passage this morning. As Jesus walked towards John, John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John says these interesting and important words. And your initial heart reaction to hearing these words today is perhaps one of three different things. Firstly, it's maybe the case that you have heard that phrase before. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But to a lesser or a greater extent, you don't fully know what it means. So you've heard it, you understand something of what it means, but you don't fully know what it means. Um, so hopefully through this time this morning, we can journey together and we can have a much clearer picture of what it is that God is saying through his word within this passage and within that particular phrase. Secondly, you've maybe never heard these words of John the Baptist about Jesus before. And you literally don't have any kind of understanding as to what it is that John is saying here. This is all new to you. And I hope, I hope you would be open to all that God would say to you through his word this morning. Or finally, perhaps it's the case that you do know what this passage means. Um, you know what John speaks of here. You know the background to these words. And more importantly, you know the implications of these words for your own life as you seek to live for him. Uh, so these are three different responses that we can take from these words. And my prayer this morning is that by the end of our time today, we would all hear these words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we would not just understand these words that, that John speaks about, but we would also be changed by these words. So we would have a knowledge of what these words mean, but we would also be transformed by these words. Recognizing that they are life for our hearts, they are life for our minds, they are life for our very souls. Amen? Does that make sense? So we hear these words of John the Baptist and we find ourselves coming right into the middle of a story. And it's a story that's gradually unfolding. Uh, and all you need to do is look at your Bibles and look at where this story is within your Bibles and you'll see that it's not right in the middle, but it's in that vicinity. And all you need to do is to understand what John means when he says this. We need to understand that a lot has went before this particular story and how it relates to these words of John the Baptist eh, about Jesus. So yes, we understand what John says here, but we have to understand what went before John the Baptist's words. And I'm convinced this morning that the more and more we dig deeper into the Old Testament, the more and more we will discover why Jesus himself was called the Lamb of God and why he was also described as the one who would take away the sin of the world. So this morning, let's just walk together as we look at these words. Uh, and as we walk together, we're going to walk deeper and deeper into the Old Testament. And we're going to look at four important figures within the Old Testament. And what we discover from them is a powerful insight as to why it is that Jesus really is the Lamb of God who takes away our sin. And we see what all of this means when we see what God has done and what God has said 
and how it is that Jesus can transform and renew our lives in the power of the Holy Spirit as we connect John's words to what we see through these four individuals within the Old Testament. So we're going to focus, first of all, on Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, number one. And so let me just begin by pointing, pointing you to the prophet Isaiah, and in particular the words of Isaiah 53, uh, what we have in Isaiah 52, 13, through to the end of, of Isaiah 53, is a description of the Lord's servant, the one who has often been described as a suffering servant, the triumphant servant. And it's important we understand that the people in John the Baptist's day understood this, this suffering servant, this triumphant servant, described in Isaiah as the one who was sent by God to make what was wrong in our world and amongst God's people right. He was sent by God to change things, to make things better. And we see this so clearly in verses 6 through to 7 of Isaiah 53. This is a vivid description and it points us towards something of who this servant was and what this servant was like. Let's have a look at what Isaiah writes, starting in verse 6 of 53. We all went astray like sheep, we all have turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him, speaking of the Lord's servant, for the iniquity of his all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. And then take stock of what we read here in the second part of verse 7. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. Now, we see, I hope, the connection. Isaiah speaks of a lamb. John speaks of a lamb. Isaiah is making the point here that this servant, the one who was sent by God, was innocent. He was innocent. And in his innocence, he did not complain. He did not protest this injustice. He appeared to surrender to the Lord's will for his life. What we see from these words of Isaiah is that his nature and his actions were like those of a lamb. They were lamb-like as a lamb would be led off to be slaughtered, fully compliant to what they were about to receive. So this servant that Isaiah speaks of did the same. And I hope we see that connection <clears throat> that so clearly points to John's description of Jesus. But it points to Matthew's description. It points to, to Mark's description. It points to Luke's description of Jesus as well. So when you put the person of Jesus into the words of Isaiah, you see, you see how well they fit. When you understand who Jesus is, and then you understand what Isaiah says here in this passage, you can say Jesus himself, through his very life, had our sin, our iniquity, laid upon himself. Jesus himself was oppressed and afflicted, and he did not open his mouth. Jesus himself was like a lamb led to the slaughter. We see why it is that Jesus was described by John the Baptist as a lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world precisely because of what we read here in Isaiah. So I hope this helps us understand something of what John the Baptist was driving at when he spoke about Jesus as a lamb of God. Jesus is the lamb of God because the suffering servant of Isaiah was the lamb of God. But let's go further into the, the Old Testament and let's just see something more of why it is this title, the Lamb of God, is even more significant for the people of John the Baptist day. And we're going to look at the life and the work and the ministry of, of Solomon. So we're going from Isaiah now to Solomon. And to do that, we're going to journey back even deeper into the Old Testament and look at uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and the opening three verses of this chapter. And what we find here is a description of what took place from Solomon as he led, as he governed, as he served God's people. We read these words. Then Solomon began to build the Lord's temple in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David, David at the site David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He began to build on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. These are Solomon's foundations for building God's temple. The length was 90 feet and the width 30 feet. Now, this morning, it's important we understand the significance 
of what was happening here. So we understand Isaiah and the connection. I hope we see the underst I hope we see the connection between Solomon and Isaiah and also John the Baptist as well. The temple was the only place in the day of Solomon where God could dwell amongst his people. This was the location where God was with his people in the days of Solomon. And I love this description of the purpose of the Old Testament temple. It was a place where the presence of God had met humanity. It was a place where the presence of God met humanity. And this was all part of God's plan to show that he still loved his people. He still cared for his people. He always wanted the very best for his people. And he did that by demonstrating his desire to be amongst them. So God literally came down to earth to meet with his people in the city of Jerusalem. And the city was on, this location, this temple was on Mount Moriah. All of which was an expression of the love that God had for those who he had created and called. So why is any of this important as we think about these words of John the Baptist? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, it's important because of what took place inside the temple. The temple was where God met with his people, but it was through the sacrifice of animals that permitted God's people to meet with their God. So as the writer to the Hebrews tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, which is why we need to understand more and more of God's plan here. God was allowing sacrifice to take place in the temple so that he could meet with his people. And this is why we need to look at the life and leadership now of Moses to understand this further. So we're going from Isaiah to Solomon. So let's have a look now at Moses. And I hope you're still with me as we're digging deep into the Old Testament here. Number three, Moses. Because through all that Moses did and taught, we have a clearer understanding of why the sacrificial lamb was so important as it ties in with all, all that we've already looked at. In Leviticus, a sacrificial system was in place and it was in order for God's people to have their sins removed, in order for God to ultimately meet with his people. So have a look at what we read in Leviticus 4 in verses 32 to 35. Moses writes this, But if the offering that he brings as a sin offering is a lamb, he is to bring an unblemished female. He is to lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter it as a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. And if we continue on in the second part of verse 35 of the same chapter, we read this. The priest will burn it on the altar along with the food offerings to the Lord. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf for the sin he has committed and he will be forgiven. So the lamb was central to the sacrificial system and it was central to all that God's people had to do in order to have this sin problem dealt with. In order to maintain this relationship with God, the lamb was central. It was a sacrifice that opened the door for this relationship with God. And this ought to be a really important challenge for you and for me as we think about our own relationship with God. So let's just take a, a week and a sidestep here and just think about our own relationship with God. If you and I want to be near God, if you and I want to experience his felt presence within our lives, then we need to confess sin. We need to hand our sin over to him every single day. We need to repent of our sin. We need to, to be open to his forgiveness. And we need to live in light of the fact that we have been forgiven. Uh, this wasn't the only time that Moses was instructed by God in relation to the sacrifice of a lamb. So we see it in Leviticus, but we also see it in the Exodus story. Uh, God gives instructions to Moses about what he and the people must do in order to avert the devastating consequences of the 10th plague. So have a look at Exodus 12, starting in verse 5. We read these words from God to Moses. God says to Moses, you must have an unblemished lamb, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel will slaughter the lambs at twilight. They must take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat them. And then have a look at verses 12 to 13 of this passage. God instructs Moses with these words. I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and strike every firstborn male in the land of Egypt 
both people and animals. I am the Lord. I will execute judgments against all the gods of Egypt. The blood in the houses where you are staying will be a distinguishing mark for you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. No plague will be among you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So the importance of a sacrificial lamb did not begin in Leviticus in the life and ministry of Moses. It began in Exodus. And from these words we see so clearly the Passover lamb protected the people of God. It was a lamb that sustained and strengthened the relationship between God and his people through the blood. So this morning I hope we see the connection as we go back to that statement. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I hope we see it in Exodus. I hope we can see it in Leviticus. I hope we see it in Solomon through the temple. I hope we see it through these words of Isaiah. But let's keep going. If there's more for us to understand as we think about Jesus as the Lamb of God within the context of the Old Testament story. And we're going to finally just look at Abraham. Not just look, we're going to look at Abraham. And I want us to look at the life of Abraham. And I want us to see what took place again on that same spot. It took place on Mount Moriah. Genesis 22, starting in verse 2. God was testing Abraham. And God said this to Abraham. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. So God tells Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And Abraham obeys. He moves forward with what God had called him to do. So we read on in verse 3. So Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took with him two of his young men and his son Isaac. He split wood for a burnt offering and set out to go to the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Then Abraham said to his young man, his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. In his hand, he took the fire and the knife and the two of them walked on together. Then Isaac spoke to his father Abraham and said, my father, and he replied, here I am, my son. Isaac said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is a lamb? for the burnt offering. Abraham answered, God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Then the two of them walked on together. When they arrived at the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and placed him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, he replied, here I am. Then he said, do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided on the Lord's mountain. Now we cannot miss this this morning. This passage is a key for us to understand all that John the Baptist speaks about. First of all, uh, take note of the fact that Abraham named that place where he was ready to sacrifice his son Isaac and the altar, the Lord will provide. In Hebrew it's the phrase Jehovah Jireh, God will provide said Abraham, and God did provide for him on Mount Moriah. And it's the exact same spot that God provided for Solomon. This was the exact spot that the temple was built, the temple where lambs were provided for sacrifice. And not only that, this was also the same spot that Jesus fulfilled the words of the prophet Isaiah, the passage we looked at already. It was on Mount Moriah that Jesus was oppressed and afflicted in Jerusalem. Yet he did not open his mouth. It was on Mount Moriah that Jesus was led like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep silent before his shearers. 
And it was on Mount Moriah Jesus faced accusation after accusation, and yet he did not open his mouth. So we see, I hope, the geographical significance of this mountain. And the second thing I want us to see from Abraham is that when Isaac asked him where the lamb was for the burnt offering, Abraham's response was that God himself would provide the lamb for the burnt offering. But what we often miss is that God did not provide a lamb for Abraham. God provided a ram. Abraham said that God would provide a lamb, and yet this did not come to pass. God provided a ram. Something else was going on here when Abraham said this. So my suggestion to you this morning is that Abraham is speaking prophetically here. God will provide a lamb, and God did provide a lamb. He provided a lamb in the person of Jesus. And it's only as we look at these words of Abraham and the life and ministry of Moses, the life and ministry of Solomon, the life and ministry of Isaiah, that we truly understand what John the Baptist meant. And we truly understand what Abraham meant when he said that God would provide a lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I hope this makes sense to us this morning. Suddenly we understand that each and every chapter and verse in the Old Testament is like an arrow that's pointing towards Christ. Suddenly Jesus' words in John 5, 39, where he says, you pour over the scriptures because you think you have eternal life in them, and yet they testify about me. I hope these words start to make perfect sense to you. Abraham states with confidence, God will provide a lamb, and John the Baptist responds, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So we cannot get any clearer than that this morning. Abraham speaks beyond his circumstances and he shows a solution to the sin problem that every single one of us has is in Jesus. Our God will provide all that we need. And so I wonder this morning, do you honestly believe that? Perhaps you have, you have said that in your heart at some point in your life. God, I believe that you're going to deal with a sin problem in my life. But I wonder today, yes, you may have done that in the past, but today as you live and as you breathe and as you think of the challenges and the difficulties and the sin issues that you carry, do you believe that he will take away your sin? He is the Lamb of God and he will take away your sin. Let me direct you to some more words of John. First of all, John, uh, 1 John 2 and verse 2. John says this, and I hope this helps us see more and more of who Jesus is. John says, He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not, for, and not only for ours, but also for, vo for those of the whole world. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Then take stock of his words again from John. Same letter, 1 John 4 and verse 10. John says, love consists in this, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So none of us chose consciously to love God. It was in his power that we had the ability to love him. And he sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So the amazing truth for you and for me is that we no longer need this temple system. We no longer need to make these sacrifices in order to be right with God. Something of what Neil touched upon earlier. He is, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for the sins of everyone in this world, past, present and future. So John again says in Revelation 7 and 13 to 14, he has this vision of the future. And John says, then one of the elders asked me, who are these people in white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. Then he told me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So we are made clean. We are made pure because of the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. One day, all will be made right because of the blood of the Lamb, because of Jesus' sinless and perfect sacrifice for you and for me. He went so far he died for you and for me. He suffered so much in order to give us life and to give us relationship with him.
See, the amazing thing about the Christian life is that we can wake up every morning and we can choose to be with him, to be in his presence, to sing of who he is, to pray to him, to receive from him through his word. So let, let that be our heart's cry as we journey towards Easter. Let us be saying in our hearts, behold the Lamb of God. He has taken away all of my sin, past, present and future. Maybe this is our, our heart's cry this morning. I'm just going to share these, these words, which I feel are just so pertinent to all that we've looked at uh, this morning through these passages. They beat your brow. They mocked your name. Creation spit in the Creator's face. They took those hands that hold this world and pierced them through with condemnation's nails. Oh, what kind of love is this that chose to die a sinner's death? How sacred, how selfless, how precious, the blood, the blood, the blood. So gracious, it's outrageous, King Jesus. Your love, your love, your love. And though we did not drive those nails, it was our sin that held you in that place. But all the blood upon our hands is cancelled by the priceless blood you bled. Oh, what kind of love is this? You took our place and paid our debt. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Uh, Sinclair Ferguson, in Things Unseen, uh, says this about the God that we worship and has provision for our lives through his sacrifice. Let's just take stock of his words as he describes what God is like. He says, this is what he is like. He is the God we can trust to provide us with everything we need. Because, as Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things? Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And if you want to be sure he will, then look nowhere else than to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because there he has proved that he will provide beyond any doubt. So, next time you hear these words, from John the Baptist, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. My hope and prayer is that you understand those words in light of all that we've just looked at this morning. From Abraham to Moses to Solomon to Isaiah, all of what they said and all of what they did points us so clearly to Christ as our Passover Lamb. And my hope and prayer is but as we hear these words from John the Baptist, you really do see what it means for you and for me today. That in Christ we have been set free, and if we are free, then we really are free. And it's all because of the blood of the Lamb. We experience that freedom because of his blood. He is our perfect sacrifice. And my hope and prayer is that we know with all that we are, that this Lamb will be our future. He will be with us for eternity. John so clearly underlines this in Revelation 7, 17. John says, For the Lamb who is at the center of the throne will shepherd them. In other words, this Lamb is going to shepherd you if you're in Christ. This Lamb is going to shepherd me. And He'll shepherd us for all of eternity. He will guide them to springs of, water, of the waters of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So what an incredible promise we can take hold of this morning as we think about Jesus as our lamb. And I wonder this morning if you have yet to make that decision to follow him. I wonder this morning, if that is you, what is stopping you from making that decision to follow Christ? God loves you so much, he sent his one and only son to die for you. And I want you this morning just to let that sink in for a moment. Even if you do love the Lord, even if you have known him in your life, let it sink in for a moment that he sent his one and only son to die for you and for me. Today you can have life because of his death. Do you want this? Do you believe this? Are you willing to receive this? Let me encourage you. God is with us. He wants you to trust him. And he wants you to say, I'm giving my whole life to him. 
And if you want to do that today, then I invite you just to speak with myself after our time this morning. I would love to talk with you, to chat through what it means to follow him. Or speak with someone you know who, who is a Christian, who loves the Lord. And they will chat with you and talk through what it means to follow Christ, to be a follower of Jesus, and to have a secure eternal future in him. You know, every single week, uh, we take time to sing together. After the message, we, we take the bread and the cup, which we'll mention in a minute. We have tea and coffee afterwards. And this is, this is a great opportunity to have fellowship and we should have conversation, but it's also a great opportunity to pray for one another. And so perhaps this morning you are facing something that, that you just don't know what to do with. Uh, you need prayer. You need God to guide you and you need the support of this, your church family, then have the courage to speak with someone you know, myself or someone else, and they'll pray with you and ask that God would strengthen you and whatever it is you're facing today. My prayer for each one of us this morning is that we walk away from this time renewed, we walk away recharged, we walk away as strengthened people in the Lord because we have one another and we carry God's Holy Spirit and he has called us not to do this Christian life by ourselves. Uh, part of that might be to receive prayer for healing. And I just want to remind us this morning, that the church has a number of testimonies over the last few years of healing. The last four, five or six years, I can share with you testimonies of people who have been healed. And the reality is uh, that a part of us praying for your healing is your openness to it you have to be open to that as a possibility. Uh, I'm not going to stand here this morning and say that you will be healed. The truth of the matter is, when we don't ask that God would heal, he doesn't heal. When we do ask, sometimes we see God heal. The key is sometimes. It's not always a guarantee, but let's be open to the fact that God might and God can do that in his name and for his glory. So if you are suffering in some way, physically, even emotionally, then do speak with us. And we would love to pray for God's healing touch to be upon you. The invitation is there for us to respond in these ways. And today we come to the table, as we always come to the table, we give thanks for Jesus' perfect sacrifice. And as we come to this table, I'm just going to invite you just to declare in your heart or with the person you're with as you come to the table, just to say these words, Behold the Lamb of God who really has taken away the sins of the world, including my own sin, all of the junk, all of the nonsense, all of the ways I sin, but also all of the ways that have been sinned against me. God, I give that to you. You have the power to take that from me. It was on the night in which he was betrayed that Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. And in the same way, he took the cup. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. For as often as we take this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. So let's come to this table and let's say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for all that you are to me. Thank you for all that you have done for me. I come to this table and I rejoice that my sins have been washed clean. That I'm now white as snow. That they have been cast into the sea of forgetfulness as far as the east is from the west. My sin has been separated from me because of the Lamb of God. He has taken away all of my sin, all of my sin. Let's pray together. Let's rejoice in that fact as we respond in these different ways. <laughs> Father, we, we thank you for this opportunity we've had uh, to worship you, to rejoice in all that, that you have done for us. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would continue to, to work in our lives. You would continue to convict us. Lord, would you forgive us of our sin and would you strengthen us so that we have hearts and mouths to, to declare your goodness and your grace in our lives today. Bless us abundantly. Be with us. Help us to respond in these ways. And Lord, I pray that we would not do it out of routine. We would do it out of worship, out of wholehearted worship to you. We thank you for this time. We honour you. We magnify you. We glorify you, Jesus. Amen.